plants a soul directly in each human being. Now, if you think of God implanting a soul in the way that one sees on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, God pointing with his finger into Adam and implanting a soul individually into Adam, then it doesn't work at all. Then evolution and theology come into a clash which cannot be resolved. But in fact, the individual soul means that God has a care of each individual life. But that doesn't need to be implanted by the very hand of God. If evolution is the case, then God sees the body is ready for the soul and has that individual care of the individual life. And that, I think, is what is meant by the doctrine of individual creation. In the 19th century, Darwin came as a great shock to the church. Most church people then still believe literally in the book of Genesis. Nowadays, of course, no respectable theologian does anymore. So it's not a problem. Darwinism is no longer a problem for churches such as the Church of England or the Church of Rome. In the United States of America, there's a rather different story. Even today, there are very influential uh, religious influences which take the book of Genesis literally. And that's an entirely different story. But in Britain, there's really no problem. As far as the science is concerned, evolution is one. Creationists have raised the issue of how Darwinism impacted on society. They point to the distortion of moral values which has resulted from an ideology based on the survival of the fittest. This phrase, first coined by the Victorian social philosopher Herbert Spencer to describe natural selection, has become inextricably linked with social Darwinism. The original Darwinian idea of natural selection was strictly within biology and it, it, it turned into selection of genes in, in gene pools. But it's obviously a very seductive idea and the temptation has always been to apply Darwinian ideas more widely than that. And uh, towards the end of the last century there was a move uh, called social Darwinism where particularly successful industrialists used to invoke the survival of the fittest to justify their own um, ruthless behavior in the marketplace. At the other end of the political spectrum, Karl Marx linked evolutionary struggles for existence with the class struggle. The signed copy of Das Kapital, which Marx sent to Darwin, remains unread. The ideology of the survival of the fittest was eventually perverted to justify mass murder in Nazi Germany. Darwin, who was a liberal-minded and kind man, would have been appalled. When, as a 22-year-old, he embarked on HMS Beagle, he knew that this was the journey of a lifetime. He could not have anticipated the wide-ranging impact of his findings. After the publication of The Origin of Species, Darwin spent the rest of his life in varied scientific research. In 1871, he expanded on his evolutionary theories, openly addressing the issue of man's origins in his book, The Descent of Man. By now, evolutionary theories were accepted, and despite the link made between man and higher primates, the book did not arouse a major storm. An indication of Darwin's continuing diversity was the publication in 1881, the year before his death, of a study on earthworms. At the time of his death, Darwin's theory of natural selection was undergoing a period of decline. Other scientists attacked Darwin's failure to exactly identify the mechanism which powered natural selection. The revival of his theory in modern times owes much to the rediscovery of the genetic work done in the 19th century by Gregor Mendel. Modern theory has unlocked many of the secrets Darwin could only guess at. Neo-Darwinism is the name that's now given 
to the marriage between Darwinism and Mendelism, um, the importing of particulate, the idea of particulate inheritance into Darwinism. Uh, particulate inheritance means that heredity comes in discrete particles. You either get a particular unit, nowadays we call them genes, you either get a particular gene from, say, your father, or you don't. You don't get half a gene or a quarter of a gene. It's, a, it's either there or, or not. And it goes through to the next generation, the grandchild generation, or it doesn't. It goes through to the great-grandchild generation, or it doesn't. So there's no blending. There's no tendency for genes to dissolve into each other or dilute each other's effects. They're either there or they aren't there. That's Mendelism, and when you add Mendelism to Darwinism, you get Neo-Darwinism, and Neo-Darwinism really works. Recent advances in genetic engineering have brought mankind to the brink of what is arguably its most controversial experiment, the cloning of human beings. The act of creation, of bestowing life itself, has become a product of genetic science. It is now possible to bypass the long process of evolution in order to create new species without reference to nature. There are many areas in which this sort of consequence of Darwin's early work um, can be used for the alleviation of, of, of suffering. And anything that can be used for the alleviation of suffering is to be welcomed in any Christian ethic. The other side of this is when um, one can use this knowledge for what is known as cloning. Once we're into that area, then we're into something very dangerous and to be avoided. Cloning of mammals is something radically new. Uh, if humans are cloned, then it will be something new. As to whether it's a bad thing or not, I take a, a rather liberal line. It seems to me that if something is going to be forbidden, there's got to be a good reason for forbidding it if people want to do it. And so people who want to forbid it have got to demonstrate that it will do harm to some individuals, some identifiable individuals. And you must be able to say who is going to be harmed and in what way. I think cloning brings with it many very difficult moral problems. I think if a child is produced by cloning, the emotional and physical problems would be enormous. And I see that as the major difficulty about cloning human beings. We're playing with things which we don't understand yet. Charles Darwin died on the 19th of April, 1882. Ironically, this most private of men, who had described himself as an agnostic, was buried at Westminster Abbey. What happened was that a group of his scientific friends suddenly saw an opportunity to have science honoured by the nation and um, grouped together and approached the, I think, the Dean and Chapter of Westminster Abbey and persuaded them that he should be um, buried in the Abbey. But Mrs. Darwin stayed away and was eventually buried in the churchyard at Darwin. The press coverage of his death is indicative of his status as an international figure. The Times eulogized him, acknowledging his contribution to science. The German newspaper Allmein Zeitung went further, describing the 19th century as Darwin's century.